1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. I want to speak to you concerning, well, Paul's going to use this phrase, in word only. In word only. You'll see that phrase in just a moment. So I'll read to you out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. I'll read to verse 10, the conclusion of the chapter, and we'll be looking at this together tonight. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia but Achaia, but also, and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so let's begin by just laying a little bit of a foundation. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice how Paul begins here in chapter 1, verse 5, how he begins by saying this, for our gospel did not come to you in word only. Our gospel. Let's begin with that for just a moment. Lay a foundation Paul refers to the gospel, notice this, as our gospel. The word gospel means extravagant news, great news. Whenever you hear somebody speaking about preaching the gospel, that's what gospel means. The word means simply great news, amazing news, really. And so he's speaking concerning this amazing news that is called the gospel. Now, the word gospel is used something like 55 times in the New Testament. So it's a common word. It's used quite often. And uh, when you define gospel in terms of its theological content, the gospel is the news of the coming kingdom, salvation through Jesus Christ, and what relates to being saved. In essence, that's basically the gospel. Now, as we look at this, and he speaks of our gospel, I want to point out that he's not saying that the message of the gospel originated with him. He's not saying that. When he says our gospel, he's not saying like it's something I created, it's something I invented. When I was in college in a secular university, we had uh, a professor, one of my classes was in comparative religion. And the professor gave to us, um, you know, we had to buy a book that we had to read. And it was related to comparative religion, therefore it would give various religious beliefs and all, and one of the writers or contributors to this particular book was saying that the gospel originated with Paul. He said he was the one who invented the gospel. Now, this was not a Christian school. This was a secular school. And so that's what you commonly get if you take comparative religion in any college or in a high school, for that matter. There are those who will say that the gospel originated with the apostle Paul, but Paul would have argued with the professor. Paul did argue with the professor. If, he, if that professor would have taken a, a moment to read Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, he would have seen what Paul would say concerning the gospel. He says there, I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul was not saying, I invented the gospel. He was a recipient of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, he said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. So he's not saying that the gospel originated with him. And if he's not saying that, then what is he saying? Well, by referring to the gospel as our gospel, Paul is saying that he also has partaken in the blessings that you find in the gospel. You see, the gospel is good news to all sinners. And Paul included himself in sinful humanity. The gospel was brought to him, he partook of it, and he preached what he received. Now that's where true gospel preaching gets its authority. The preacher is first the partaker. You have to give 
that which you have received first. You cannot give what you don't have. So when Paul would speak of himself, he had said it like this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. He would say, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. I have partaken, and now I preach. So the our gospel isn't that the gospel originates with Paul. The our gospel means I'm preaching to you that which I've received myself. I am a fellow sinner just like you. I'm reading a book. I believe we have it here in our bookstore. If not, I'm going to make sure we get many copies for those who might be interested in it. It's a, it's a book called The Reproducers. And it was written when Calvary chapels were first beginning. So it's, it's 40-some years old. So for me, it's, it's still something I relate to because I got saved 40-something years ago, right? So I've been reading it just to remind myself of my own traditions and histories in terms of the, um, the first things that I encountered as a Christian. And as I'm reading through this and remembering through this, uh, Pastor Chuck Smith, you know, at that time was in his early 40s. Uh, he's interviewed, and they're asking him questions and all, and, and he simply keeps saying the same thing. He keeps saying that people are coming, and they did. They came from worldwide. People would fly in from South Africa, from Japan. They came in from different countries in Europe. They were coming to, to, his, to his church, and they wanted to see what is going on here, that all these youth, all the youth is showing up. And, and, and it was such a phenomena that uh, on one occasion, Chuck told us that, that somebody, because they knew that a lot of youth were showing up, they asked him to go and speak somewhere once. And, and he said, I'm sure they thought that I had this emotionality because they come from a Pentecostal background. They must have felt for sure that, that I would cry as I was preaching. He said, but the only person who ended up crying was the guy who invited me to speak, you know. <laughs> but Chuck says, and this is, this is the heart of our ministry, that, um, that really what was the, the thing that was drawing people, and guys, this is an important thing to say right now, is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. It's always been that. It'll never be anything different. It'll always be, and I'm going to develop this in a moment. I'm just getting ahead of myself right now, to be honest with you. It will always be the Word of God and the Spirit of God. That is what makes a revival happen. The Word of God and the Spirit. And the kids would show up. I was one of those kids. I was 20 years old. Would show up not to be entertained, but to be edified so that I might grow in my faith in Jesus Christ. I didn't need entertainment. I'd already been in the world. The world is very entertaining, but it also is a death system. It's drinking salt water when you're in the world. You can drink the water, but it will kill you. It will never satisfy your thirst. It only makes you thirstier. And that's what the world does. And you keep, keep having this, this, I wonder what it is I'm missing. There must be something else. And that's what the world will do for you. It's like that, that proverbial carrot on a stick in front of the mule. It just once, if I take one more step, I'm going to get it. One more step. But you'll never reach it because it's always one step away. And that's how the enemy works. And so the biggest and most important thing for us is, is the word of God and the spirit of God so that we might have this knowledge of the ways of God and the things of God. And this gospel we partake in, and it's this gospel that we have received that we give out. And so he's speaking about this gospel, and he says, Our gospel did not come to you 
in word only. Now, notice how he's saying this gospel that he partook in had actually come to the Thessalonians. So that tells us that the gospel is not to remain in church pews. It tells us that the gospel is intended by God to be taken out of the place of instruction into the place where people have no knowledge of God. That's called evangelism. That's called missions. This gospel came to you. So it's taken out. It's not meant to remain in the church pews. It is meant to be shared. And that's what we see in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Again, our call by God is to be givers as well as the ones who live. We live and we give. We live the gospel and we give the gospel. And one of the reasons that sometimes we're not effective in the giving is because sometimes we're just not effective in the living. We're just well, living the message. It's interesting how the Lord Jesus Christ said this. He said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. He didn't say you will do witnessing. He said you will be witnesses. And so what happens is this message of transformation, this message of grace, this message of peace and love and joy, this message of forgiveness, this message of a new life, this message of hope and encouragement, this message of the gospel is a transforming message. And we become the witnesses. We don't just go out and talk. We walk and we talk. We walk the walk of faith, and we talk what we are walking. All of us, uh, before we got saved, I'm going to assume, perhaps I'm wrong, but I'm going to assume that all of us at least once in our lifetime encountered somebody who claimed to be a Christian who just didn't act like one, as we understood what a Christian was. And sometimes we were more rigid than we should, let's face it. You know, we were real legalistic anyway. That's part of the reason I didn't come to Christ is because I thought once you get saved, you can't laugh anymore. You can't enjoy life anymore. You know, so I, I, I know that I was distorted, and perhaps I have some other distorted people in here um, who thought the same kind of way. And why would I want to, you know, get, become a Christian if you can't enjoy life? I mean, life's to be enjoyed. And here I am, you know, and I'd never met a real Christian. But, but I think all of us, at least at once, one time I've encountered somebody who claimed to be a Christian and just didn't really live in a way that was appealing. And a lot of times uh, we might even be raised in a house like that. Our parents may have been churchgoers. They may have gotten us ready to go to church. We went to church, but when they got out of church, they just were not real. And we saw that all of our lives, perhaps. There are many people I've spoken to like that, that all their life they've seen hypocrisy in the home. One, when they pull onto the driveway there and into the church grounds, whatever church they're going to, suddenly mom and dad are different people entirely. Hi, brother so-and-so. How you doing, sister so-and-so? You know, all of that. Then they get back in the car and they drive on home and they're, they're you know. I was talking to, I'll give you an example. I was talking to somebody not that long ago who said that her dad was a, a deacon in the church, was in line to become an elder in the church. And in church was always, everybody thought brother so-and-so was just a great guy. She said, but the problem was, is my dad was an alcoholic. I mean, while he's there in church, they're all thinking he's sweet and mellow and kind. She says, but at home, he would drink and he'd get mean to my mom, and he was abusive. But when we were on the church grounds, my dad was a holy man. And a lot of people have seen that, right? And so we don't want to be what we say turned us off before. And if we're going to be effective, well, let's let God work in us to transform us by his power and through his word. And then we can take what he has given to us, we can live what he's given to us, and we can give to others that which God has, has given to us too. So he's saying this in verse 5. He's saying the gospel did not come to you in word only. Now when he says it didn't come to you in word only, the point he's making here, it would seem, is this. He's saying we gave you the gospel. Without compromise, 
And we gave you this gospel without alteration. And the reason we would give you this gospel, it didn't come to you in just word. The reason it came to you in the way that we gave it to you is because it isn't mere words. The gospel is God's revelation. The gospel is not man's philosophy. If you turn your Bible to chapter 2 here in 1 Thessalonians for just a moment and look at verse 13, notice he says, Chapter 2, verse 13, for this reason we also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So you received this and it wasn't the word of men. You received it as the word of God and it had an impact. It effected change in your life. Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.18, said the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So the gospel, gospel came to them in power, and that power enabled complete transformation because God's word, and you might want to mark this in your heart, God's word can conform you, and through God's word, any broken life can be healed. Any broken life can be healed. I believe that. I, 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 I'm up here as testimony to that. And I know many living testimonies of broken lives that have been healed by God. The word of God has that power and received by faith and allowed to work. In Psalm 19, verse the law, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The word perfect there means lacking nothing. It is a complete revelation of truth. It is completely sufficient. That's what perfect means. The word converting means to refresh, to revive, or to repair. The word of God is completely able to repair your soul. It is. It is. When you take God's promises into your heart, I went through a period. It lasted quite some time until finally the Lord broke through of, of intense, intense, intense depression. I didn't know that Christians could actually feel it the way I did. Never got suicidal. Just gave up just gave up. And I was a young believer, went through a real painful time. My mom, I had led my mom to faith in Christ. My mom came in. I still remember speaking to her. I was in the den at my parents' home. And she said something to me about God and his word. And I remember saying something like this to my mom. I remember saying, you know, it's good for those it, it, it's, it's good. Yeah, the word of God is good for those who can actually benefit from it. If you believe it, that's good. My mom looked at me with, with shock, and she said to me, you're the one who led me to faith in Christ, and now are you doubting your own salvation? I said, it's good for you, but it's not good for me. I had got, I, I had, point, and I won't go too much into this, but I had stayed in my room. I wouldn't leave my room. I actually would close the door of the room. I, I had my back against the wall, and I would cry for hours a day. You, can, you can't picture that, can you? Because that, but that's, that happened. I had my back against the, in my bedroom, on my wall, and I would rock back and forth for hours, and I would weep, and I would weep. And my sister Madeline would come in, and she would sit next to me, and as I would weep, and she sat there. And this didn't go on for a day or a week or a month. It went on and on and on for some time. And one day, I was in my parents' den, and I hadn't picked up the Bible, and I hadn't read it. And somebody may be thinking, well, wait a minute. I was still teaching at the time. I never told anybody what I was going through. I didn't have anybody that I could talk to. How many of you know what I just said? I didn't have anybody that I felt I could talk to. Isn't that a sad thing for us as believers to actually admit that I didn't trust anybody? I wouldn't tell anybody. 
I kept my feelings to myself. What you see up here is a healed man, even though I weep, is a healed man. Because I wouldn't tell people I loved them. I wouldn't tell people I cared about them. I was, I was the most distant person you could know. And I got worse, not better. And one day I'm reading the Bible. And as I was reading, because I hadn't read it for myself, and I was in John 6, and Jesus has his disciples speaking to him. He's speaking to his disciples, and he's watching people fade away. And Jesus turns and looks to his disciples, and he asks them a question, do you also want to go away? And as I was there, I read that. Do you also want to go away? And I still remember closing the Bible with my thumb in place. And I prayed a sincere prayer for the first time in some time. And I said, where can I go? I've already given up everything I have. I have no friends. I have no life. I've been going to Bible college now for years. I've been doing Bible studies. I have no place to go. Where can I go? And then I opened the Bible, and the response was, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And that's a word that the Lord gave to me that moment. And I still remember it very well. Where can I go? You have the words of eternal life. And that changed my life back to where it was supposed to be. And it hit me, God speaks through his word. And he just did right now. You have no place to go because you've already gone to the one you needed to go to in the first place. He never abandoned me. I was walking away from him. See, so the word of God is powerful. It's like a double-edged sword. It separates the soul and the spirit. It awakens us to truth and versus that which is not true, and it solidifies us. And so this gospel can heal you. This word does heal. And, and because it's so powerful, one of the things the Lord taught me, and I'll say it this way, is that the gospel does not make God acceptable to me. It makes me acceptable to him. It changes lives, you see, and heals. And this gospel comes, he says, with the working of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God and the Spirit of God works together. You see, when Paul would bring this message of this gospel, it was working alongside of the power of the Spirit. So the Spirit would bring conviction to those who were held in spiritual bondage. It would awaken them. Like Jesus said in John 16, 8, that the Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so when the word of God is presented, the Holy Spirit's work is to work alongside of his word, and it brings an awareness of of your sinfulness and your need for a savior. And so it's a work of the Holy Spirit, and it's not the work of a man. When, When the gospel goes out and people hear the message of the gospel, it isn't a successful sales presentation. It is God's Holy Spirit working through his word to actually get into the deepest recesses of a human being's soul and awakening them to their need for God. That's conviction. So it was a work of the spirit, not the work of man. Now, when Paul would preach, notice how he said he would do so in much assurance, in much assurance. His preaching style was one of assurance. He had assurance speaks of a passionate confidence. And he would present this message with a passionate confidence because, indeed, it it is God's very word. He believed that he was giving God's word. Now, of course, we're living in an age when the gospel is regarded as irrelevant to real life. Some don't consider it to be exciting. Some don't believe the Bible's that important. And because there are pastors who have fallen into that trap, it's actually given rise to pastors who have stopped preaching with confidence and they've developed various styles. Some pastors have become entertainers. They, we call it polishing the presentation. They polish the presentation. They, they speak well, eloquently. They just polish the way that they preach. And they make sure that they never bring a word into the church like sin or judgment because that's too discouraging. Because today, there's a lot of people, I, I, I know you know what I'm talking about. I don't have to 
beat this horse. Um, I believe in preaching the whole counsel of God, the blessings and the warnings, the blessings and the warnings. There are warnings as well as blessings, and we need both. We need both. I've heard preachers say, I've got to give you some bad news before I can give you the good news. And, and to a degree that there's some reality to that. Now, I don't like to, I, I, I don't like to preach the bad news. You know, I don't. But when you're going through the word of God, you're going to hear both sides. You're going to hear God's fullness, right? Well, there are, there are preachers that make their churches kind of like Home on the Range. Some of you don't even know that old song, but there's a song, Home, Home on the Range. You ever hear that? Where never is heard a discouraging word. Their churches are that way. Where never is heard a discouraging word. We, we certainly don't want you to walk out contemplating your life and where you're going. We want you to feel that this is a happy place and you can have a happy time every time you come here. And they polish their presentation. They become entertainers. There are others who become storytellers. They love to tell their stories. But what that creates is dull-minded sheep that are hungry for stories only. There are some who become magicians, you know. They pull things out of the Bible that aren't there. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That, that's true. I, look, at, I, I, I think better than I speak. I'll put it that way. I, I think better than I speak. I write entirely different than I preach because I take my time to think through every point that I'm putting down on paper. Sometimes when you're speaking, it may not come off as clear as you'd like it to. But I can tell you this, I listened to a lot of messages, and I can tell you that guy didn't study that passage. That passage didn't say that at all. I remember watching this one fellow, I won't give his name, I don't feel like it today. <laughs> all I know is that he was laying on, on the platform, crawling on one elbow across it, very entertaining, very entertaining. And he had his microphone in front of his face as he was dragging himself across, talking about Moses being in Egypt. And, and then they struggled. And I'm watching him enact this. And I'm thinking, bravo, good acting job. But what you're saying isn't what Exodus taught. What you're saying is entertaining your congregation. And they love it. They like seeing that man crawl across the stage. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Listen, one of the things, if you guys, if you guys, you know, me, I, I'm very, I, I'm, I don't know why I keep saying this. I shouldn't have to, but here I go. Um, you know, I think stories and illustrations and jokes and all of that's fine. Our personalities are good. But if you, if you, if you, if you're promoting those things and not the gospel, you're in trouble. I'll put it that way. And and, when, and listen, those of you who teach, and I know I have teachers in this room. Let me give you something. You know, just just teach as if, like if you're teaching First Thessalonians, and I would teach it entirely different. I have to tell you, if Paul was sitting here, I wouldn't be telling you stories. I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be giving you an entirely different Bible study. But at the same time, if Paul could sit there and recognize the Scripture and say, yeah, that's what I intended to communicate because the Holy Spirit instructed me to write that, then you're probably teaching that passage. But if you come up with a scripture, I remember somebody giving a message on Jesus wept. Then he went through an entire study on the therapy of weeping. And I'm pretty sure Jesus wasn't trying to give a therapeutic session concerning how good it is for you to experience catharsis through tears. But that's what happens. You just use the scripture and you launch off and you go in any direction that you want. And because people are dull of hearing, in the latter days, People will no longer endure healthy doctrine. They will heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. They'll turn aside from the truth and be turned unto fables. And that's what we're living in right now, where some of the largest churches in the United States aren't even built on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the sheep who are there love the stories and the humor and the encouragement, but they're not getting Bible studies. That's happening right now. Some become magicians. Some ride a hobby horse. They always find their pet doctrine in the passage that they're teaching. Some rely on enthusiasm and personality, but that produces a personal following. Some follow the latest trends, 
hoping to retain relevance to their hearers and make the church into a cool place to be. I am not quite sure that church is supposed to be cool. And I'm pretty sure that a preacher is not intended by God to try and make a congregation happy. I think a preacher is intended by God to encourage a congregation to be holy. And the only way that happens is if the word of God is taught. And that's how it works. And so Paul ministered the word of God confidently because it's the word of God. He didn't give the impression that there's another way to God because there's only one way. And so as we look at that, I want to get into the second portion of verse 5. And he says this, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. That's a very important point. Paul not only taught them out of the Bible, but he also lived what he taught before them. Nothing undermines the effectiveness of the message more than hypocrisy. In chapter 2, verse 10, he said, You are witnesses, God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. The message of the gospel is undermined by those who do not live out its message. We need to remember that God is personal and his message creates community. And the community lives out the message together because community gives what is called human flesh to the gospel of love. There are those preachers who prefer simply giving the message, but they become only messengers. What I find interesting, again, in chapter 2, verse 8, he says, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you, listen, not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. We didn't want to give you just the message. We wanted to give you the message and a heart. And that's what Paul did. You know, I had one professor saying that the Apostle Paul was just a heartless intellect. That's just absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. He speaks concerning the fact that to do the Corinthians, he says, I was with you in tears. He, he wept uh, openly on more than one occasion. He, he wrote with such a passion and love. To say that this man was only an intellectual is to not understand 1 Corinthians 13 or any of the other passages that he spoke concerning his open-hearted preaching. I, if, all you need to do, as we did not long ago, is go through 2 Corinthians, and you can see the most open-hearted letter that a, man, that a man could possibly write. He said to them, he said, the more I love you, the less I am loved by you. He was an open-hearted man. He loved those sheep. He loved them with all of his heart. And he was willing, he was willing for them to know him in that way. You know, every minister, and I speak to pastors this way, every minister's church ought to know one thing outside of the word of God, which is the key thing, of course, but they ought to know their pastor loves them. They ought to know that. They ought to know that because he's supposed to. Because what is it that Jesus said, we looked at this recently, is the mark of the Christian? Love. Love one another. And the pastor ought to be a man that you think has a loving heart. And I'm not speaking of myself, but the pastor in any church. The sheep should not be afraid of the shepherd. My pastor, Chuck Smith, was a great man. Billy Graham, when he was in town many years ago, when Billy was doing crusades or was having meetings in L.A., Billy Graham was known to go on the... Uh, the parking lot at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, Billy Graham would go in the parking lot and sit in his car. The assistant pastor, Romaine, um, was sharing how that they asked Billy once, what are you doing in the parking lot here? And Billy Graham's response was, I like to come and sit here so that I can just sit in the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit because I know the Holy Spirit's power resides in this place. Now, isn't that amazing? That's amazing. And it's true. And it's true. The power of the Holy Spirit. I am telling you, we need more of the Spirit in our life. He said, you became followers of us and the Lord. The church re respects their leadership, 
and as a result, grew closer to God. Philippians 3.17 says, Brethren, join in following my example. Note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Philippians 4.9 says, uh, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. He says you received the word of God. Now notice he says you received the word of God in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. The word received, you received the word, means to welcome as if a guest or a visitor and you're giving them a warm reception. Now there had been opposition to the gospel in the city, but they welcomed the word of God. The unbelieving Jews had opposed Paul, stirred up a riot, followed him to Berea as it was recorded in Acts 17. And they would not have left these new believers in peace, but they responded to such great news uh, with the Spirit, and it actually birthed joy in them. They had joy in their circumstances, and they had a joy that their circumstances could not quench. They went through hard times. But hard times, this is, this is an important thing I've learned and I'm learning. Hard times deep in faith. Hard times deepen faith. Sometimes we think that when we get saved, we shouldn't have a single bad day from now on. Mm, I'm saved. Joy, joy, joy. I've got joy. <laughs> but what did the psalmist say? Psalm 119, 71. It is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes, so that I may really understand what I'm talking about. In Psalm 119, verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, I keep your word. You learn some deep things. Here's something for you that won't make sense. <coughs> Nothing I've said up to this point will or has. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, one, of the, one of the blessings in growing older, and I'm actually enjoying growing older, one of the blessings as you grow older is this. I have come to understand what the term means when they say, this too shall pass. When you're young, you think what you're going through right now is going to last forever. When you've got small kids and you're a young mom, you're thinking, oh, how long, oh, Lord, how long? Will you <laughs> abandon me forever? You know? You have three kids, and you gave them all biblical names, you know, Josiah and James and Lucifer. I mean, you have everybody. <laughs> they all have biblical names. How long, oh, Lord, how long will you abandon me forever? Right? It feels like this trial's going to go on forever. I was talking to a young lady in this church years ago now, but I'll never forget what she said. She said, Pastor, I'm in a terrible trial. It feels like it's never going to end. She says, I've been going through it for two weeks now. And I just smiled. <laughs> I just smiled. I said, really, darling? Because life in one way or another is a trial as long as you live. But you realize something, you're never alone in that trial. And you discover that God is patient. And you also discover that if he has said it, he will do it. And you hold fast. And you don't let go. And sometimes it'll take a month. Sometimes it may be a year. Sometimes it may be five years. Sometimes it may be 10 years. Sometimes it may be 20 or 30 years. Am I encouraging anybody yet? But then God moves in his time, and it's always the perfect time. I really have. I'm, I'm telling you the truth when I say this. I have come to a place in my walk with the Lord where I know why sweat the small stuff. God's in control. He's going to do what he wants to do, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against the plans of God. God will do what God wants to do, and I trust him in this. And I've learned, and I'm learning. And I've learned he is faithful. He is faithful. 
You can pray, and you can pray, and you should. And you hold on, and you hold on. But those who, uh, who sow in tears will reap with joy. And God moves. Weeping endures for a night. But it doesn't last forever. And the Lord brings joy. I can tell you that. And I have deepened in my walk with God through the afflictions that I might learn his statutes and learn his faithfulness. And so he's speaking to these people who are going through some very tough times. That's how believers respond to affliction with joy of the Spirit. Psalm 31, verses 1 and 2, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. What was the result? Verse 7, you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. The other believers, upon hearing of your persecution that you've gone through, have been strengthened and encouraged to live for Jesus Christ. You began by first being imitators, but the result, you have become models. In Philippians 1.29, it says, To you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. The result, verse 8, From you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. In spite of opposition, God's word explodes and is exploding through you to others. Like a mighty trumpet blast, like a peal of thunder, the word has exploded from you. It has sounded forth. Whole regions know what you stand for. You stand for serving the Lord Jesus Christ. In the midst of your affliction, the word continues going forth. Not only are you evangelizing, but you are also, according to verse 10, you are waiting patiently for Jesus in sustained anticipation. For you know that Jesus is even at the door, and you are excitedly waiting to see him. You have not lost heart. You, you're not going back into the world simply because he hasn't returned. Because you know that in Jesus, everything you go through is worth it. Because ultimately, you will be with him. So you are waiting for his son from heaven. A sustained anticipation, waiting. When I got saved, they were saying, Jesus is coming any day now. 44 years later, he's one day closer. 44 years later, he's one day closer. Has he said it and shall he not do it? Has God given a promise that he will not keep? God is not a man that he should lie. God, is, God speaks the truth. He's coming again. So, occupy until he comes. Be busy. Don't lose heart. Remain strong. Bring your friends to know Jesus Christ. If you have a daddy or a mama who doesn't know the Lord, don't give up. Keep praying. Keep seeking the Lord. Keep sharing when given opportunity. Live for Jesus in front of them. You know, most of us could probably say something like this. Most of us could say our moms probably know us better than the average person. They raised us. And if they were around us at all, they got to know us a little bit. When I got saved, my mom was just waiting for something to happen in our family that would be good. When I got saved, my mom, when she came to faith in Christ, my mom would, my mom was like a, I was like a fly and my mom was like a spider. I'll put it like that. She would, she would pin me down and she would ask questions 
an hour at a time. David, have you read this yet? What do you know about this? Have you studied this yet? What do you know about this? I would do that every day with my mom. I'd come home from school. I'd sit at the kitchen table, and she'd say she'd, she'd pull her chair up. It used to drive me crazy at first. She'd pull her chair up across from me, and she'd say, okay, what did we learn today? What did we learn today? I want to know about Jesus. Tell me more about him, son. And that's what led to me teaching Bible studies to my mom and my dad, because my mom was constantly hounding me, tell me more. And even as I had Bible studies, she did it anyway, as long as I lived there. And by the way, even to her dying day, my mom was still asking me questions about Jesus. And one of the pictures I have of my mom that is so dear to me is when my mom was bedridden for the last year of her life, she couldn't get out. She had a broken hip and broken, broken back, and she couldn't do anything anymore. She was just stuck in a bed. But one of my favorite pictures I have of my mom is an Easter Sunday service. She's got the little computer. It's open up, and she's all the way in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but she's looking at her son preaching the gospel, and my sister Becky took a picture of her because her little hand was in the air going, yeah, Jesus, that was my mom. <laughs> that was my mom. And so sustained anticipation, waiting for the Lord to come, but occupy until he does. Going through the affliction, yeah, the hard times indeed, but going through it because that's exactly what we do. We go through it. We don't stay in it. We pass through. And the Lord, through the affliction, he refines our faith, strengthens and deepens us as human beings, gives us a message that has some strength to it and some meat to it, and we can speak to people and we can say, indeed, this is what the Lord says and this is true because God's word is true. And that's why Paul would speak not in word only but with a confidence because this is the word of God and it is true and God is not a liar and what he says he shall do. He will bring it to pass. And I bless God for being that kind of God to us. A, man who is, a God who is true to his word to man.